Hello, my name is Adam Boitha. I'm the director of Epicenter, a network of nine leading think tanks from all across Europe. We seek to inform the EU policy debate and promote the principles of a free society by bringing together the economic expertise of our members. The following video is one of a series of webinars conceived and hosted by the IA to understand and debate many of the issues raised by the coronavirus pandemic. Leading think tank heads from Germany, Italy and Greece will join us to analyze their government's economic response to the pandemic and provide an assessment on the looming economic crisis. It is my great pleasure to welcome Alexander Skouras, who is the president of CAFIM, the Greek member think tank of Epicenter. Alexander returned to his home country, Greece, in 2007 to join the leadership of CAFIM, and he was previously the Director of External Relations at the Atlas Network in Washington, D.C. Secondly, we will have Alberto Mingardi, who is the Director General of our Italian member think tank, Instituto Bruno Leoni. Alberto is the founder of IBL, which has been at the forefront of Italian economic and political analysis since 2004. Alberto is a political scientist, the author of a number of books, and a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, and Politico. And after Alberto, Clement Schneider will outline his thoughts on the economic situation in Germany. Clement is the director of Prometheus, the prominent classical liberal free market think tank of Germany. Prometheus has been at the forefront of liberalizing debates in Germany in the last six years, and I'm sure that it will remain an important cornerstone of a free society in the upcoming decades as well. So thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. And Alexander, let, let us kick off with Greece first. Your country has only started to recover from the 2008 economic crisis in the last three years. But the total economic output is still far below the levels it has been 12 years ago. So please do walk us through the economic and political implications of this renewed crisis um, for the Greek people. Well, thank you, Adam. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you personally and also the IA. Uh, the IA is a very important organization for me and for KEFM. Uh, because besides our partnership and our participation at the Epicenter Network, uh, we consider ourselves for like uh, uh, disciples of the Anthony Fisher School of Think Tanks, uh, which is something very important to us. So speaking at an IA event, uh, especially since uh, this is the first time I'm uh, doing this, uh, it's a great honor and a great privilege. Uh, it is so much a great honor and privilege that I will ask everyone to bear with me in case you hear some babies screaming in the background, uh, because we recently had uh, a five month, a five day old baby uh, come into our house. So I, I would like to be excused if uh, something uh, like a crying baby comes through your uh, microphones. Now. Uh, when it comes to Greece, it's a, it's a very interesting period for sure. Uh, I've prepared a few remarks. It, will, it won't be long uh, with a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and uh, the, in order to show a little bit of where the country is right now, as you correctly said, Adam, uh, we came out of a decade long crisis. And uh, as soon as the Greek economy started to uh, grow, um, not spectacularly by any fashion, but it's, it started to grow in the last couple of years, we've had this pandemic, which is uh, destined to uh, put our financial situation in a, in a very difficult uh, condition. But uh, this pandemic brought uh, something that has been hailed as a global success story for Greece, and this is important. Uh, because after uh, a decade of being like uh, the precautionary tale of failed statism and uh, uh, a government that went solvent, essentially, uh, we did a pretty good job uh, if the, the, the goal was to flatten the curve. So Greece flattened the curve and achieved its goals in containing the spread of the virus. Uh, up until now, we've had only 2,900 confirmed cases. Currently, there are only 19 people uh, in ICUs with respirators. Um, there, there, were, there have been 171 deaths, which is 171 more than what we'd like. But still, it's a number that uh, shows that the, the, the policy mixture that was chosen, which was a severe lockdown for about a month and a half, which with uh, a, a very eager reopening that's taken place uh, since early May, um, 
worked as far as this objective was concerned. So um, th this was the good news. And because I know that many of you may have heard that our favorite pastime in Greece is demonstrations, I chose to show this picture of a very well organized uh, communist uh, uh, recent demonstration that practice social distancing. As you can see, they're very organized at keeping right distances uh, among them. They were still able to demonstrate against uh, their government. So, you know, that was something we didn't lose from our day-to-day -day, uh, lifestyle here in Greece. Now, more seriously, um, where are the, the country's uh, macroeconomic predictions, right? So we were forecasting a 2.8% increase in our GDP. The baseline scenario, which I don't consider baseline anymore, uh, was 4 to 5% contraction, and the bad scenario was 9, nine to 10 it looks like the bad scenario will be, uh, uh, we'll be all very happy if it's 9% at the moment, uh, a contraction to our GDP, uh, which means that our debt to GDP ratio is gonna increase again uh, from 101.2% uh, to 196.4%. And our projected, our projected surplus of 1% will go to a 6.5% deficit. Uh, and this raises another, uh, a number of important political uh, and strategic economic, economic questions about the viability of the Greek debt. Uh, but I guess we'll have, this is, you know, this question will be answered in a broader context uh, because what happened here was not that uh, the Greek government started spending money uh, uh, on welfare programs that, uh, you know, they were using to buy votes as they did uh, in previous decades, but this is all the response uh, to the COVID crisis. And here is the basic policy mixture uh, that the Greek government announced recently uh, last Sunday, um, and it, it has to do with the reopening stage, with the reopening phase of our economy. So there have been some tax cuts, but mostly we're witnessing uh, relief benefits, tax deferrals, which is still a positive, and a few uh, but important uh, areas of reform. So, you know, we free market people, we don't like to, we, we're always uh, interested in what lies at the, ha at the heart of the matter. Um, Greece right now, and even according to our prime minister who said recently, I am a liberal, but this is a time for Keynesianism. Uh, we're dealing with Keynesianism on steroids right now. Um, those of you who are not familiar with Greek politics, this is still better than most alternatives that Greece has to offer. Um, what we realized was that there wasn't a comprehensive free market approach to how to deal with, pan with a pandemic. And this is something that maybe our movement and uh, the think tank scene of uh, the free market movement should look into into the future. Uh, there's a, an increased threat of a prolonged government control in the economy. Government right now is touching almost everything. Uh, and um, at, the, at the end of this situation, if it comes in, 2019, in 2020, uh, we will be, our economy will be devastated because that not only we had a 10 year crisis that cost 25% of our GDP, we're also having a pandemic that's going to cost an additional 10%. And unfortunately, the Greek economy is not in a position uh, to even think about a V-shaped uh, bounce back. Uh, the fundamentals are not very strong uh, in our economy. Our, the markets are not very open. Uh, taxes are, very, are still very high. Um, employment costs are still very high, uh, but the government has some plans that I'm sure we'll have the chance to talk more uh, in, as this conversation goes on. So those are my initial uh, comments, and I think I'm right on time with the five minutes that were allotted. So thanks. Indeed you are. Thank you so much, Alexander, for outlining your thoughts. Some, some scary numbers, definitely, but it's good to hear that the government is handling the situation reasonably well. Um, it's scary to think about it, how it could have been in some different political scenarios. Um, Alberto, your country has been at the center of attention for most of March because the pandemic started a few weeks earlier in Italy than in the rest of Europe. How hopeful are you that Italy's economy is going to get out of this a bit sooner than the rest of Europe's? So, Alberto, over to you. Well, thank you, Adam. Thank you so much for uh, having me. Um, I likewise feel a profound affection towards the IEA, so I'm very happy to be with you today. 
Um, the COVID-19 crisis has basically found in Italy a very frail patient, uh, an ideal victim uh, with pre-existing conditions. Uh, the country entered 2020 with a predicted annual GDP growth of around 0.2%. Um, and, you know, um, basically last year, the public debt uh, reached a worrying 135% of GDP. So Italy was very fragile before the pandemic. And now when we're looking at projection, uh, we see that the lockdown has severely impacted Italy's economic activity, with industrial production shrinking by something like 30%. Let me say it again, 30% between February and March 2020. So although uh, essential supply chains uh, were kept active uh, so that groceries did not run out of food, uh, the industrial and economic activity in the country is crumbling. Uh, the International Monetary Fund predicts now that the Italian GDP will plunge by 9% in 2020. And some people are saying it's a rather optimistic estimate, believe it or not. Um, and, you know, we expect uh, a budget deficit of 8% this year and Italy's debt to GDP ratio rising from 135 to around 155% uh, this year. Now, one of the biggest problem in this dreadful situation is, let me try to share my screen. Um, let's see if I succeed. Okay, I, sorry, I, I needed to change my preferences, but let me, uh, I, I'll try to change my preferences and share this picture later on. Um, I'm, I'm not a, as good at Zoom as I thought I was. Um, one of the biggest problems is that the epidemic, the biggest outbreaks were in the North. Uh, so the North is the industrial powerhouse, is the part of the country which is more internationally integrated in the economy. Uh, it is quite frankly, the part of the country which is contributing uh, most of taxes uh, to the government. Uh, so the fact that the initial outbreaks were in Lombardy and Veneto, uh, that roughly speaking uh, provides, you know, more or less one quarter of the Italian GDP, is making uh, the situation even more problematic economically uh, speaking. Uh, also, the quality of healthcare provision in Italy is very uneven. Um, the uh, healthcare system in the North had huge problem, but the quality of healthcare provision before the crisis was basically reputed to be fairly good. Uh, whereas in the South was highly problematic. So one of the main reasons why we went for a national lockdown, as serious really as the one uh, that you got in, in, in China. So somehow the strictest lockdown you experience in a Western democracy was really this vision of uh, having a duty to protect uh, vulnerable people that were not necessarily all people, but people in regions where the quality of caregiving was extremely low. Now, the numbers are getting uh, way better. You know, at the peak uh, of the epidemic in Lombardy, we had something like 1,700 1, ICU beds full with COVID-19 patients. Uh, today, I think it's around 180. Uh, so the situation improved, um, uh, but the healthcare system were put into a severe stress uh, and the number of casualties, particularly in some provinces in Lombardy, uh, has been very high. I mean, altogether, Italy has uh, 32,000 people that died uh, out of COVID-19, which basically means one-tenth uh, of the people that died worldwide, and clearly we don't have one tenth uh, of the world population in the case you didn't notice. So it's been dramatic. It's been dramatic also for our public finances. 
uh, one thing which is really worrying me is that the performance of the government has been pretty bad in spite of the fact we assume for whatever reason uh, that scarcity of resources was not a problem and the pattern in we, that we see emerging is one in which money is spent not necessarily uh, in healthcare but for, for a whole bunch of expenditure uh, that clearly uh, have the goal of pleasing people uh, and not of strengthening uh, the Italian healthcare system. This is indeed a very worrying sign and both you and Alexander mentioned structural issues with the Italian and Greek economies. So I'm sure we will come back to these, these points more in detail later on in the discussion. Um, on the other hand, we also have Clemens from Germany and Germany's economy remained robust during the financial crisis a decade ago and the country's public health response performed exceptionally well during the pandemic as well. So Clemens, what, what is the reason for this kind of German exceptionalism? Are you guys really just so much more efficient than the rest of us in Europe? Wow, <laughs> that's a very difficult question. Um, well, let me begin by, by also expressing my gratitude to be, have the occasion to um, speak at the IA event uh, and also with such esteemed colleagues as Alexander and uh, Alberto who are really know their way around and um, I feel like the little one <laughs> compared to them. Um, so why is German, the German situation once again exceptional? Um, I mean, it's probably there is a lot of just chance, I believe. Um, I mean, we haven't been in the situation that, that Italy was in or Spain with some uncontrollable outbreaks. We just got lucky there, um, I believe, as far as I can um, assess that situation as a non-epidemiologist. Um, but then, of course, we have some more economic issues that are um, seemingly much better than in other countries uh, in Europe or worldwide. For example, just to present one figure of the promised uh, response on government spending in the whole EU, I think like 50% are only have been promised by the German government. And of course we don't make 50% of the EU population. Uh, but much less. So obviously we are firing from all um, the power we have to try and stabilize our economy. Um, it is probably much easier to do this if you are in the um, well public finances situation that Germany is in because we have had this, some call it the fetish, uh, more liberal or classical liberal minded people might call it uh, the blessing of the so-called black zero, which was something the government has been, and the, also the legislation has been working towards for 15, 20 years now, that we do not, um, uh, well, we, we don't take on any new debt, uh, which has been possible, thanks to many factors um, in the past years. And so we have very solid public finances, um, which allows such a massive intervention from the government. Uh, I mean, we're speaking like, just to give you some uh, brief overview of the numbers. Um, the German government has promised uh, 353 billion euros as direct help uh, by now and 819 billion euros in guarantees. So from the federal government, which is just like, this is, sounds insane for anybody who's, who's coming from a country like uh, Italy, Spain, or Greece. Um, and this, there is this power to sort of um, send signals that we are sustaining the industry and sustaining our um, uh, economy. Let's see how that works. Uh, I mean, we are bound to subsidize a lot of uh, zombie companies that are already on the verge of like bankruptcy, but have been just held up over the last years by very um, low interest rates and stuff. But um, we'll have to see how that really works and how much the psychological factor kicks in and how much you really have to try and assist those, those companies. 
Um, one tool that has been used by the German government, which probably helped a lot to mitigate the problem of unemployment, is uh, the it's called Kurzarbeit. It's a term which I believe is already used in other languages by now. Uh, it's like, um, well, like the, the, the general rule is that companies can say they can like get to the government and say we have to implement this Kurzarbeit, which means like short. Uh, labor and which means that they cannot uh, employ their people in, on a regular basis at the current situation but the government takes over I think 80% of the um, actual costs of the um, employing these people um, so that they don't have to kick them out of their business they can hold them for a while for some months of crisis and can start restructuring and start looking for new ways of employing people so that you don't lose your employees. So people do not appear in the uh, unemployment statistics and on the other hand side, the companies have the opportunity to keep them and keep the resources that are uh, well connected to employees who are who have been working with the company for quite a while. And that worked rather good and has a good impact on the employment statistics and um, finally of course what is a big issue is the whole question of export um, germany is a very export focused country as you all know and if we have problems in countries like china or the us that will also heavily um, be, be a heavy burden on the german economy so the prospects aren't as good as they might look right now from the outside if not even our German uh, speaker is optimistic, uh, then I think these are rather worrying times. Um, but you mentioned an interesting point um, with the fiscal flexibility of Germany during the crisis. Even Wolfgang Schäuble announced now that there needs to be a lot more fiscal flexibility towards Southern European members. And of course, um, the German Frank Franco deal announced by Macron and Merkel uh, seems to support that and there seems to be 500 billion euros in form of grants um, but also in form of loans um, being provided to mostly southern European member states that have been um, the hit the hardest. Um, is that actually good news for classical liberals? That's mostly for comments. Okay. Um... Well, um, that's very hard to say right now. Um, I think generally uh, it's not good news and it's interesting how like the, the traditionally classical liberal countries now that Britain has left the EU, uh, which would be the Netherlands and Austria and Denmark and Sweden at the moment are uh, heavily trying to steer uh, the, the, the boat away from this Macron-Merkel path because uh, they probably still believe, as they did 10 years ago or 12 years ago with the um, debt crisis, the public debt crisis, uh, that this is not going to actually help and that a lot of problems we are now experiencing in the economy is also because we didn't put Europe onto a sustainable path of reforms and of um, economic deregulation of and all, all the stuff we, we liberals love. So. Uh, I, I think the road is not a good one we're taking there. Um, and instead of this like overall spreading of, of money, I think what we would be much more important is to actually help those who suffered exactly from that crisis. So those it's, you have to target it much more precisely in order to avoid some zombie economics to kick in. Sure, that makes sense. Alberto, would you like to quickly react to what Clemens said? Yes, I, I think it was very appropriate that you asked Clemens to answer this because he's the one who's going to be paying and uh, Alexander and I instead are supposed to be getting the money. Uh, but still, I, if you know, it, we are dealing with, very, with solutions that are very far uh, from what we would like to see. Let's take it. So, um, I think that in a classical liberal perspective, uh, if uh, we have a choice, the choice is between very, very dissatisfying uh, solutions. Uh, I think that if I 
need to spend a good word for the European Union. I would personally prefer uh, the money to be channeled to European institutions, to be awarded uh, with European grants to businesses for whatever uh, purpose. I think this will create major distortions. Uh, in particular, we will be seeing, you know, all the distortions predictably coming out of a Green New Deal taking place. But at least if it is European institutions awarding the grants, we will see some sort of reasonably competitive and transparent procedure. If the money grows to the Italian or the Greek government, well, we know what we're going to be seeing, which is what we're seeing already in Italy, which is, you know, bonuses uh, for people to buy a bike. Uh, so if you're giving 500 euros to people to buy a bike, because you think this is the way in which you solve the problem uh, that public transportation is clearly going to experience because of COVID-19, well, we know that you're not really solving those problems, but all Italian will expect now on that government is buying their bikes. Let's hope we're not necessarily going down that way. And I would like to switch briefly to Alexander, who was rather optimistic in his take uh, when talking about Greece. So could you name kind of the most positive parts of how your country and your government has handled the pandemic and the economic response to it? Yeah, uh, well, uh, let me clarify that uh, I was mostly uh, optimistic about the healthcare aspect of uh, how we've dealt with the crisis, but I still find some positives in the economic approach. In the economic approach as well, um, uh, in my view, there there have been you know there's this sense. Our, our current government is a center right government, and uh, they came in power uh, almost uh, eleven months ago. Um, with a mandate to reform, right? Reforming and pro-market reform was a big aspect of uh, uh, their campaign and uh, their electoral message. Uh, they, they're all in favor, at least in rhetoric, for reducing taxes, uh, making, you know, doing business uh, ranking, improve the doing business ranking, um, and uh, many positive aspects. Thus far, uh, the main positive things that have happened are number one, uh, there was a, the institution of uh, a full tax deduction for uh, research and development expenditures for companies. This uh, was announced last Sunday. So whenever companies are investing uh, in R&D, they, they will be able to deduct uh, uh, those expenses from their tax bill. Uh, another positive thing that happened was that they, sp they decided to speed up due to the need for social distancing, uh, many aspects that have to do with uh, e-government, right? So electronic government. Uh, the, the, the system that we have here, the public, the public sector system is very archaic for compared to most other European countries. Uh, but now, you know, you don't, uh, the average Greek, if you want to uh, notarize someone to do something for you, you don't have to go and wait into these long queues in order to get a stamp that verifies that it's you signing the document or whatever. You can do it online. They've built a, a new government port port portal and uh, it seems to be working very uh, uh, efficiently and people are happy for it, right? So this is something uh, that makes not only uh, doing business with the state easier, uh, but it simplifies the lives of everyday people who otherwise would have to miss a whole day or half day of working just in order to uh, get a, a few stamps uh, from uh, the appropriate public agency. Um, the other thing uh, that see that you know, we have to give credit to our government it has to do with their, how they're dealing with the taxes. Um, number one, the deferrals are very important, right? They, they had other tools available and a lot of money because right now, you know, the, all the treaties, the EU treaties that bind uh, each European member on uh, their deficits uh, are no longer in state. 
uh, in, at play. Uh, so they, they had the fiscal space to, you know, do whatever they wanted. There's also this big political debate in Greece about whether they should run, a, the government should go for an election right now because they're leading in the polls by almost 20% to the major opposition. So it would be a very good time for them, but it would also be a very irresponsible time for them to go to the polls. So uh, there, there was a lot of debate on whether they should go to the polls in order to avoid uh, uh, the negative consequences of an electoral system change that is due for the next election, right? So um, it would help them a lot if they went to an election right now, but they've decided to uh, go against that and that's to their benefit. And they've, they've made, the prime minister has made it very clear that all these measures that they're taking, they are temporary. Not, you know, you can never take politicians at their word, but it's an important admission, uh, especially when it's emphasized by the, the head of government uh, that these measures, the extraordinary measures that they've taken, they are indeed extraordinary uh, and they will not stick around after uh, the, the COVID crisis passes. So it's a, it's a mixture. Um, and, you know, because, uh, Few Alberto and Clemens talked a little bit about the European aspect of this. Um, there, you know, whenever there's government involved in allocating resources, we cannot expect efficiency. Um, and whenever the, the more layers that are uh, involved, the more layers of government that are involved, the more the efficiency tends to get worse. So uh, in Greece, for example, there was a case where uh, there was use of European funds. The, the government wanted to support uh, the scientific community. So they gave, they gave a coupon uh, of, uh, I, th I think, 600 euros for all the uh, scientists uh, and some professional uh, industries to get the 600 euros, they would have to uh, sign up for a training. Now, you can only imagine what kind of trainings these were. Suddenly there was a huge outburst of uh, uh, trainings that, was, that were taking place in Greece, teaching people how to use Windows 95 and uh, how to use the Internet Explorer and stuff like that. I'm joking, but, you know, you get the point. It was that kind of... Uh, uh, misuse of funds. So we, we need to be very careful in our role as a free market think tank is to keep track of all these changes that are happening, uh, decide which ones, you know, judge whether uh, they would be good for the long term or not, and make a very strong case for keeping the good ones and uh, throwing away the bad ones once uh, the new normalcy will come. Certainly, that's absolutely right. Um, I would like to just remind the audience that we have the Q&A session going on, but if you would like to ask a question to our panelists, please do so it under the Q&A tab and not the chat. And under the Q&A tab, you also have the opportunity to vote for questions that you like. So I would like to turn to one of the most popular questions on the list. Um, we have it from an anonymous attendee. The question is, given the frequent use of wartime rhetoric in the media, for example, the idea that we have not faced the challenge of this magnitude since the Second World War. Is there a case to be made for, for this outbreak, providing some kind of impetus for a potential post-pandemic economic expansion in much the same way that the Second World War arguably led to the so-called Golden Age in the 1950s? So we are continuing the theme of optimism how optimistic are you all that the golden 20s are going to return after the pandemic is over? Alberto. Well, when it comes to Italy, um, you know, the sort of um, problems we're having today in terms of um, GDP degrowth expectation equals the fact that between 1939 and 1945, Italy lost 10 points of GDP. So in a sense, the situation is similar. Uh, however, uh, two points um, that may explain my pessimism. Uh, the first one is that the Italian fantastic economic development in the 1950s with growth rates around seven, eight, nine percent a year uh, with relatively stable money was by and large the result of benign neglect. Uh, there were lots, of, yes, there was lots of state businesses in the economy, but the idea was, you know, 
let us allow private businesses to have a go. We don't see that mentality around. The second point is that we had that benign neglect because the Italian ruling class, including the left, uh, was uh, clearly thinking that the fascist economic policies failed. So that the system of control and protectionism uh, that fascism implied in the economic sphere uh, was a failure for the country. Uh, nowadays, even in a country like Italy, where basically half of GDP is public spending, uh, of course, uh, the most popular narrative is that we are coming to an end of a neoliberal age. So when it comes to the common persuasion, people are really thinking, you know, COVID-19 will help us in reshaping our economies in an anti-neoliberal direction. Uh, government is thinking about entering the equity capital of many firms. And I think at a certain point, uh, these uh, will certainly affect uh, our growth expectations. Certainly, the notion of planned economies is not coming back in a way like it used to under socialism, but more and more people are using the expression manage the economies. And of course, who else to manage those economies um, but the government? Um, so indeed, from a political narrative perspective, these are certainly difficult times for classical liberals. Partially linked to this question to Alexander and Clemens, um, the second question is, which European country do you think will struggle the most to recover from the crisis? So you're welcome to address both or either of the questions. Clemens. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to address the first question more. I mean, the second one is very speculative um, and difficult, I think. But uh, the question, what is going to be the post-corona development of economics, uh, also if you compare it to other uh, similar events, I think the one major difference to World War II is that we are not in a destroyed continent. So there was a lot of catch up to do after 1945 in the 50s, because you had to rebuild big parts of the continent. You had to really, a lot of stuff was destroyed that had to be rebuilt. Uh, nowadays, I don't think so many things are destroyed, but rather um, failures are triggered that had been there systematically already, but had never been you know, properly addressed. They have been um, drawn through by the ECB policies and by government intervention and subsidies and whatever. Now things are failing either because they just never could survive anyway without uh, the, the help from the ECB or the governments or because the, it's directly related, like it's short-term business like restaurants or whatever. And I don't think it's so easy to catch up that, um, that kind of destruction you have there as opposed to a post-war economy. And that also relates to some psychological questions. So I think the spirit in which people were in Europe in the late 40s and 50s, uh, I can't really remember the time, but as far as I know from history, um, was that they really wanted a restart. They wanted to do something new. They wanted to get over this catastrophe. They also had the East of Europe as the negative example. They, they just didn't want to have communism. They didn't, just wanted to be free and wanted to be entrepreneurial. The experience people make nowadays is quite contrary because people um, on the one hand side see the state in a very positive way. The state is the one who saves them from dying. The state is the one who uh, helps the businesses which cannot sustain themselves anymore. But now the big good state is coming to jump in and to help everybody that you know, unemployment doesn't go to the sky and whatever. So they will see the state as a very positive and um, helpful force. And on the other hand side, they will see that anybody who is an entrepreneur, who has a small business, a restaurant, a nice startup idea, they are the first ones to really get screwed massive, big time in such a crisis. So a lot of people will not be inclined to become entrepreneurs themselves, uh, but rather try to get into those um, areas of business which are big business where you have safety or to some kind of government uh, finance jobs. So I think that is the main problem we have to address as classical liberals that we have to like 
simulate this entrepreneurial spirit, which naturally came in the post-war times, but which is now actually under, under heavy fire. That sounds like a pretty dangerous path to go down because many European countries already lacked entrepreneurship in the last couple of years. Um, so if the situation is going to get even worse, that, that's a, we're looking ahead uh, to some difficult times. Um, Alexander, based on the European Commission's predictions, Greece will be the number one victim of this pandemic with the highest economic downturn. Um, so linked to the question that was asked, uh, which European country do you think will struggle the most to recover from the crisis? The European Commission would probably answer Greece. Uh, would yeah. you agree with that assessment? Yeah, the, the, the European Commission and uh, the IMF, uh, they, 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 they can crunch the numbers better than uh, I have uh, thus far. So uh, I, will, I will have no objection to that. As I already said, you know, this is a, a grim outlook for, for the country. Um, and the point that we've been trying to make is that this came to Greece, you know, the Greek economy is almost dependent on tourism and uh, the tourist season was cut in half for this year. Uh, they're talking about reopening uh, slowly in, uh, in, in the summer in July um, uh, for European and other countries to start coming in. Uh, but it's going to be a short season with uh, lower profit margins, lower arrivals, and it's going to be difficult. So tourism accounts for about 25% of our GDP. This is a big hit. Now, as I mentioned before, Greece had a previous experience with uh, an economic crisis, a decade-long one that cost 25% of our GDP. And the lesson learned from that was that if we do not fix the fundamentals of our economy, there's no hope, there's no way that Greece will miraculously do better than the worst case scenario from now on. Greece is currently 79th in the world in the Doing Business Index and 102nd in economic freedom uh, based on the Fraser Institute's report. And these are not uh, the indicators that a country that is ready for growth, even if the opportunity comes, uh, to take full advantage of it. It's still painful to invest in Greece. Uh, there's extremely high taxation. Uh, there's, it's almost impossible to, to resolve insolvency. And uh, we, have, we still have a very bureaucratic and huge amounts of red tape in, very, in many aspects of uh, everyday life. So to me, the question is uh, right now, will in this catastrophe, right? This is a, a very important uh, event, global event uh, that will cost millions of jobs and uh, a huge amount of our GDPs and economic activity in general. Uh, the real question is, for at least for the Greek government and other governments that don't have, uh, they haven't solved the fundamentals so much, is this the opportunity to leapfrog and you know, use the fiscal space that's there, the fact that people are trusting the governments more uh, in order to pass the difficult reforms that are necessary uh, in order for the countries to be able to grow in a sustainable way, to grow rapidly and quickly. Um, you know, my generation will probably be of retirement age when we reclaim uh, the living standards we had in 2009. It's going to take us 25, 30 years from now to, to reach that point at the current growth rates. That's something, you know, it's the, the old promise of each generation delivers something better to the next one. It's not true in Greece anymore. When Johan Norberg talks about how the world is indeed doing great, that narrative does not translate into Greece. It's not. We lost 25% of our GDP in a decade, right? And now an additional 10%. So, um, and I will second what Clemens said. I would be optimistic if the climate of ideas was favorable to the policy solutions that this time requires, but it's not. And this is why uh, supporting think tanks like ours or like the IEA or IBL or Prometheus is so important right now because we are investing in that climate of ideas. It, it's currently uh, less favorable than we'd like to, uh, but it could be much worse. So 
I'm, I'm not it's, very optimistic because the right ideas are not in place, but out of necessity, something good might come out. It is certainly an important role for liberal think tanks to fight for more economic freedom because a lot of these economic problems can lead to pretty scary political outcomes, whether it's left-wing or right-wing authoritarian populism. Greece was pretty uh, badly ranked on, on our index in recent years on that front. Um, being aware of the fact that we have loads of questions, but uh, less than 10 minutes left, I would like to pose one question to one individual only. So the following question is to Alberto. Um, what is the sentiment concerning the apparent lack of multilateralism displayed through the EU's reluctance to send aid to Italy during arguably the worst phase of the outbreak? Do you think this will damage the EU's internal relations? Well, the reputation of the EU in Italian politics uh, is not scoring high. Uh, I think it's uh, quite ungenerous in many ways, you know, with the current uh, frame of thinking. Uh, so uh, basically, if you prioritize the idea that lots of money should be spent and lots of debt uh, should be put on the table, I think the European Commission has done clearly exceptional moves. Um, I mean, I cannot uh, picture where Italy would be these days without the ECB doing what the ECB is doing every day. Uh, at the very same time, it is true uh, that the Italian politicians are basically claiming more, more and more every day. Um, I would like to stress one point uh, once more. Lots of this spending is not spending for strengthening our healthcare systems. I think that all of us would be okay with having some redundancy in our healthcare system in order you know, to uh, face other events uh, like the one we face. So that, that should be the learning process. What basically happened is that the Italian political class now thinks it has a blank check and therefore is going into a bunch of different spending opportunities which are not necessarily related with the pandemics. At the very same time, I will second what both Clements and Alexander said before. We don't see virtually any reform on the supply side. Uh, we don't see in this mix of reforms that are being, uh, of, you know, moves that are being undertaken by governments, we don't see much deregulation. And I think this will be disastrous uh, because if I may quote an economist that was beloved by the IEA, P.T. Bauer, having money is the end of the process of growth. It's not the beginning. We have no experience of an economy in the history of the world that developed out of gifts. Uh, and what we're trying to do is fostering development out of gift, uh, with gifts without properly considering the psychology of businessmen. What I really fear is that lots of Italian enterprises, particularly small and medium-sized businesses, will simply not open again because for them is not having money and subsidies, but having the opportunity to do what they care, to do what they want to do. So you got layers of overregulations from the past, COVID-19, uh, coercive isolation, all of that is conspiring against the entrepreneurial spirit. And the problem with the entrepreneurial spirit is that uh, in this sense, I. I hope uh, I don't get into blasphemy, but is incarnate. So there's not entrepreneurial spirits without flesh and blood uh, entrepreneurs and businessmen. Let's indeed hope that you're right, Alberto, and I'm sure that all of our member think tanks will be doing whatever they can in their domestic uh, countries to help that entrepreneur spirit recover. Clements, you live in a federal system. Germany is the most federalized country out of the three um, in this current discussion. So the next question is to you. Will the coronavirus pandemics exacerbate regional inequalities or help to bring regions closer together within countries? 
Um, what is your experience in Germany? I know that different states have handled the pandemic quite differently. Um, do you think that it will improve in the near future or that East and West is going to depart even further uh, from one another? Well, I could imagine that uh, regional differences get even worse, uh, to sum it up, because um, some regions just have advantages of regulation of money uh, at their disposal, uh, which which will help them a lot. Because even if the EU will bring up this 500 billion or 1.5 trillion uh, subsidies program, uh, it most likely will not end up there where it really helps business to grow and to um, thrive uh, on a sustainable basis. I think what is really one possible outcome is at least for Germany, and I hope that that has some set some examples for other countries, that it is very important to rely on the diversity and the competition you get through those federal states. Um, and it has shown itself quite brilliantly in this crisis that those federal states actually still have a lot of competences especially in cases of pandemics, which nobody knew about or everybody had forgotten about uh, before. And they have applied them interestingly up to wisely. Um, so we had some states that really implemented a very strict and severe policy law and order, like in Bavaria, for example. Um, and you had some that were much more thoughtful and careful and uh, try to integrate all the different aspects, not just the health aspect, but also the economic aspect, like North Westphalia, for example, where the prime minister is not very unlikely to become the next um, chancellor of Germany. Uh, and it's, it's nice to see how those different parts can show their strength and how we can learn from the different regions. And I think that is a perspective I personally would really wish for in Europe, that you have those small regions. Uh, I mean, Alberto wrote about that with the concerning the bonds, where you should enable uh, this, the single regions to take up their own debt, uh, and for example, Lombardy. And I think that would be a fantastic development for the European Union if we would learn that those regions actually can handle things much better in a crisis than a big, huge centralized state where you have a one size fits all thing. And that is one of the positive outcomes I see for Germany and maybe for Europe that we can strengthen this idea because now we have evidence. Now we can show people how it helps if you give authority and responsibility to people who are actually locally responsible instead of centralizing everything like in, in France where that led to catastrophic outcomes. Um, so maybe, maybe that is something we should focus on if we want some positive aspects. I'm very much with you, Clements, on that front. Definitely more decentralization is thoroughly needed in many EU member states, including the UK itself. Um, Alexander, I have two very quick final questions for you. One from David Lentzman, who asks um, specifically for you, Greeks appear to follow the lockdown very meticulously. This, this looks very different from the caricatures of tax evasion. Does this suggest a long-term change in respect for government authority? If so, will that have further economic consequences? And partially linked to that is one from Tom Packer, um, who's asking why has Greece had such a low death rate and has been able to come out of the lockdown so quickly? Yeah, so I'll start with the, the latter question. Um, it looks like uh, the response is, um, you know, besides of the epide epidemiological reasons that there might be, for example, climate and uh, 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 the, you know, we're still trying to figure out why the the are the, the the virus didn't spread as quickly in uh, in Greece as it did in uh, northern Italy, for example. Although there have been studies that suggest that uh, it's similar to southern Italy, the spread in uh, in Greece. So. Uh, there might be scientific reasons that we currently don't have because it's been such a short amount of time. Um, it, from a policy perspective, the Greek government adopted the lockdown uh, two weeks earlier than it would normally do, two weeks earlier than other European countries did. And uh, it was a strict lockdown. 
And uh, for a miraculous reason that we, we are still yet to find out, I have some intuitions about it, uh, Greeks indeed uh, rallied around it and they followed it very meticulously as David uh, suggests. Um, there, might, there might be a number of explanations. Uh, the most obvious one to me was that uh, people knew that uh, the Greek healthcare system is very, very weak. We only we had less than a thousand ICU units in the country. Now that number is growing. So in a country of 10 million people, uh, from uh, the Italian experience that we had uh, available at that time, uh, would suggest a very very catastrophic scenario for Greece if the disease would spread. And sure. definitely that fear played a big part in that. Um, now, does this suggest a long term change in respect for government? Uh, authority. Uh, well, yes, David, the, 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 the latest polls show that there has been a reversal in that trend. And, you know, Greeks were portrayed as uh, tax evaders and lazy and all that during uh, the fiscal crisis of the previous decade. Um, my response to that always was that for every tax evader, there's a productive person working twice as hard in order to pay for their tax uh, avoid the, for the evaded taxes, right? So it's not only uh, uh, the tax evasion evaders that should characterize a people, um, but um, it, it seems to have impacted trust towards the institutions in general. The, the Greek institutions are rising from this crisis with a, a greater amount of capital than they did before the, the, the pandemic. This could be a, a powerful tool for a reformist government, uh, but it also entails many dangers uh, because you know uh, it, the higher the degree of uh, trust in government, uh, the closer you get to absolute power, right? And we all know what Lord Acton had to say about that. So um, yes, it, it, it has been uh, a successful story, uh, the, lo the Greek lockdown, and they, now, on why they're opening and they're so eager to reopen, and I'll finish with that, um, it's that uh, on the one hand, there's tremendous pressure uh, to get the tourists here. The Greek economy will collapse if we don't get tourism, uh, as I mentioned before. Uh, so uh, that's the one hand. The other hand is that other countries are getting, a, getting COVID under control as well, so there, there are less fear. And you know, the worst case scenario is about the death, uh, the death rate and the death toll of this uh, pandemic have been revised downwards. I hope that this path is going to continue throughout the summer and that the Greek tourist sector can recover somewhat. I know that there are quite a few outstanding questions at the moment, but we have almost run out of time. So I would just like to ask three rapid questions to each of you, and you're only allowed to answer with a yes, no, or a maximum one sentence answer. So the first one is, will we see mutualized debt obligation by the EU in the next five years? In other words, will there be corona bonds or something very similar to that? Alberto, yes or no? I think we are going in that direction. Clements? Yes. Alexander? Yes. Okay, so unanimously agreed on that front. Um, how will the economic recovery look like in your country? V-shape, U-shape, W-shape, or L-shape? And if it's going to be the last side, who is responsible for turning the lights off? So, Alberto. This shape. Ouch. <laughs> Clements? Oh, goodness. Um, probably U-shaped. Fingers crossed. Alexander? Too soon to tell. Too soon to tell. And last but not least, the last question is about the future of the European Union. So are we on the route towards a more federalized EU or will nation states become more important in the next five years and the EU in its current form will wither away? So how optimistic are you about the future of the EU, Alberto? It's my turn to say it's too early to tell. Comments? There are strong forces trying to have a more federalized EU, but the EU has to offer something so that people actually rally around her, and that's not yet foreseeable. 
Okay, Alexander? Without this being an endorsement, uh, I think we're heading for a more federal uh, European Union. Thank you for your interest and curiosity. I hope you have enjoyed the discussion. For more information on Epicenter, visit our website at epicenternetwork.eu. For more information on the history of pandemics, the economic and regulatory impact of coronavirus, and much more, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel, IA London. You can also follow our podcast at iapodcast.podbean.com or visit our website at ia.org.uk, where you can also sign up to our e-newsletter, IA Daily. Thank you for watching.